Today, I know you're very busy, so thank you for taking a little bit of time to listen to me talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I'll, I'll hold the clip. Because it, it, it pulls my shirt just now. All right, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Debbie, and I'm from an organization called the Hantu Bloggers. And essentially, we have been documenting the conditions of Singapore's marine coral reefs um, and our coastline for the past decade. So let's get started. What we do essentially is take people out diving, members of the public. Now, there are a lot of people who go diving in Singapore. It's a very popular recreational sport. Um, but very few people think about Singapore as a place where you can go diving. Because when you come to Singapore, you see big buildings, shopping malls, busy streets. And, you know, it's not the place you see in a brochure where, you know, come to Singapore and go diving. But you can. And, you know, it's a really unique experience. You come up from your dive and you have an oil rig right behind you. But this is also very inspiring because it shows that these healthy coral reefs can coexist next to very heavy industries. And these industries must be doing something right if the coral reefs are still there. So whatever it is they are doing or not doing, we should find out what it is and you know, take care to maintain it. So Singapore is such a small place, right? It's a small little island. Some people don't even know where this city is. What more about its reefs? Um, our reefs are very small, it's only about 0.01% the size of the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef runs entirely along the coast of the Australian continent. Singapore is a very small reef, but it has 30% of the biodiversity in less than 0.01% of the size. And this is because we are smack right in the middle of the Coral Triangle, in the middle of Southeast Asia, where there's lots of biodiversity. And there's a lot of international interest as well. This guy over here, for those of you who are diving or are interested in marine conservation, you might probably know who he is. He is Yves Jack Cousteau, the son of Philippe Cousteau, the great underwater explorer who um, really inspired a lot of people to do marine conservation work. He's now a CNN reporter, so he was here on our reefs um, to document uh, Palau Hantu. This is uh, Terry Gossliner, he's a very famous sea slug scientist and he was also here to study our sea slugs with Singapore, so I went out with him. And these are professors and students, um, graduate students from Duke University in North Carolina who come to our reefs twice a year and they have been doing long-term studies in Singapore in various areas, uh, not just Pulau Hantu, for the past 14 years. So we may be small, we may be you know, uh, not big, but there is a lot of interest, and what is the most practical thing is that the reefs are so accessible. You know, they are 40 minutes from the mainland, from a big city, and there are very few places that are like that. So just to orientate you, give you a sense of perspective of where Pulau Hantu is, um, this is Sentosa Island. So, you know, Marina Bay Sands, that kind of thing. Um, and here's Pasir Panjang, Hopa Villa. And so usually we depart from a boat this way, this is actually an old map. Why it's an old map is because this, which you see is four islands, is now one. Um, in the past, we used to come through this way to get to Pulau Hantu over here, but now we have to go around it. So it takes about 45 minutes. Um, this is the Bukom Refinery. For those of you who were in Singapore last year, you would have read about it in the newspapers because there was an explosion and the refinery had to be closed down. So this is a refinery here. This is owned by Shell Corporation, which we work closely with. And this is another company over here, which is called Tang Store, which basically does chemical storage. And here is our precious little Pulau Hantu. It's made up of two islands, Hantu Kecil and Hantu Besar. Very simple, straightforward. Um, this is not what it originally looked like. If you can imagine, it's got too many straight lines. This can't be natural. Because in 1989, the government developed this island with the intention of making it into a place for people to go recreate, to go diving, fishing, boating. Um, and in the past, this is what it looked like. This, was, this image was sent to me by a lady, a British lady called Leanne Copping. This was photographed in 1968 from Bukom Island. So looking over there, that is Ular, where we saw just now the tank store. And this is Hantu over here. This was actually photographed from uh, Leanne's house. So this was a village, and you can see here all the gelongs and kampongs. 
living over here. And uh, one of our boatmen used to live on um, Brani as well. Brani, Bukom, Ular, Busing. Um, those are the four islands that merged. And you know, he used to tell me that he would skip school to stay on the island because he just sitting off the Kelong, he can see whales and dolphins and stingrays beneath the water. Very hard to imagine, right? Just 50 years ago. But that's how it was. This is what it looks like today. So the hill that was once on Bukom has been flattened to accommodate the shell refinery. And um, what's cool is that this lagoon here, which you know from the surface looks really dead, during the low tide when the water clears out, all sorts of creatures come in, sea stars, snake eels, lots of different types of crabs and gobies have their home in this lagoon. Um, and it's a very different habitat from the coral reef that just exists outside of this barrier. So this is what it looks like during the low tide. We have oysters, we have some marine algae, which is also very important because it feeds a lot of the small fish that come to uh, live in the lagoon. And those of you who like to eat snappers and groupers and kuning, you gotta like coral reefs because this is where they all grow up. This is their kindergarten. Now if they don't have a kindergarten, they'll never grow up into the adult fish which you like to eat. So if you like to you know, have your marine fish, then these areas are very ecologically important. We have mangrove trees, and that is actually how Pulau Hantu got its name, because in the past, um, Hantu had a lot of mangrove trees. For those of you who don't know, Hantu in Malay means ghost, Pulau means island, so Pulau Hantu is ghost island. So a lot of people wonder why would they call it ghost island. Um, and I actually met one of the villagers who used to live on uh, Pulau Hantu, and he told me that because of the mangrove trees and the you know, the good fish that you could find on the island, a lot of fishing owls used to come to the island at night. And in Malay, the fishing owls, are the owls are called brong hantu or ghost bird. And in the evenings, you will just hear the owls making a lot of uh, calls in the night. So the island is actually named after the owls that used to go there. And all this you see here, they're not rocks, they're coral. And coral is actually a type of animal, and we'll talk more about that. After I introduce to you my special experience in Pulau Hantu, or just diving in general, it's a very unique experience for those of you who already go hiking, who like to explore nature. Diving really gives us a unique experience of really getting close to marine life. A lot of times, the marine life actually comes to investigate you because they're so curious. And this file fish, I decided to take a picture with this file fish because it was following us for the dive for so long that my colleague and I decided that, you know what, we should just take a picture with the file fish. And you can see it posed right for the camera. And under normal circumstances, I would not put such a big picture of my leg on the screen, but just to show how close the marine life can get. This over here is a fish called a remora. Um, remoras are often found on very big animals such as whales or turtles or whale sharks. They latch on and then they feed on the little bits of food that drift by as the big animal swims through. And I guess in the sea, I'm a big animal. So here's a cool video um, of, you know, just to give you a sense of what it's like. Where's my cursor? Oh, here it is. This is a very unique kind of fish called a razor fish. Um, and they actually swim upside down. You know, you know fish usually swim this way. So their heads point to the ground and their tails are pointing up. And they are called razor fish because if you see when they turn this way, they become like needles, so thin. Um, and they do have a barb on their dorsal fin. So they can cut you if you, you know, touch them. That's why they get their name. And they drift this way, you know, mimicking blades of uh, leaves or grass that may be floating uh, across the coral reef. And you can see it back here as an urchin. Oftentimes these uh, fish, they like to go into the urchin for extra protection if they feel threatened. So you'll see soon that they're like wondering, why am I chasing after them? And then they sort of go into the, the urchin. And we also get big things. Everybody likes sharks. And this is a baby bamboo shark. When they're young, they have these stripes to help them camouflage. And as they get bigger, they become gray and more bold. But they always remain hidden. Um, and these sharks, they are not dangerous. They eat crustaceans, meaning things like crabs and prawns, shrimp, lobsters. So they move around the seabed. Their mouths are actually below their bodies, um, not in front like great white sharks or something. Um, but we also have black tip reef sharks, but they, you won't see them on the reef, you'll see them out at sea. 
And this is something that's everybody's favorite. Um, you know what it is? Nemo! Okay, what kind of fish is it? It's a clownfish. What kind of fish is a clownfish? <laughs> okay, it's called an anemone fish. <laughs> Actually, I don't think they're very tasty. Um, what's interesting is that this anemone is also an animal. And these anemone fish live in this anemone. They have a special relationship. And they can't just live in any anemone. There are many species of anemone, hundreds of them. And certain species of clownfish live with certain species of anemones. So if you know a certain species of anemone disappears, it doesn't mean that the clownfish can keep on surviving because they can't find that particular um, anemone to live in. This anemone actually has stings, and a lot of people think that anemone fish are immune to the stings from the anemone fish, uh, the anemone, but actually they build up this anemone, uh, this resistance. If you take a, a fish that was grown in, the, in a fish tank, and you suddenly put it into a new anemone, it will get stung, but then it remains in it and slowly develops an immunity to that particular um, venom. You see here there are six. Now you want to guess which one is the male? Six. Oh, sorry, four. Four fish. <laughs> there are four fish. <laughs> Mats fail. Which one is the male? The one, you the one you can't see. No, you can all see. There are only four. No illusion. No trick. <laughs> the smallest one. Smallest one? Actually, those three are males. The three smallest ones are males. Anemone fish are hermaphrodites. They change sex with age. Well, actually not necessarily with age. What happens is at, <laughs> at, any, one, at any one time, an anemone, the colony of fish living in anemone only has one female. And that is the most mature one. The mature one is naturally the one that is the biggest one. So if this one should die, get eaten by a barracuda or whatever reason, the second largest will become a male. Because this one actually produces pheromones to suppress the development of um, the male reproductive system in this fish. So when this one goes away, there's no more pheromone to suppress that development. So this one will become the male and then uh, the female, and then this one will produce the pheromones to suppress the other little ones. That's right. So lots of coral. Um, and we were saying, you know, corals, they are animals, you know, they look like plants, like this looks like cauliflower, this looks like a mushroom, these look like flowers, they look like plants, but they're not, they're animals. They're actually carnivorous animals. They eat little things that are floating in the water. Each one of these is one animal. This is what we call a colony, many of them living together, and they are clones. So each coral colony is a clone of one particular individual. So you have male colonies and female colonies, and during the breeding reproductive um, time, the female colonies will produce the eggs and the male colonies will produce the sperm. So it's not like this is, um, uh, yeah, they're all the, the same um, gender, if you can call it that, very strange, but yeah. Um, and they live in colonies, well, just like uh, this one looks like a rock, but it's also you know, a coral colony. Each one of these is one individual animal. And um, you know, when they're feeding, now it's, not, now it's resting. When it's feeding, its mouth actually emerges through here. So you can see the tentacles come up to grab the food from the water that's passing by. And if you think about it, we don't live in too similar, you know, we kind of like know what they're living. We live like them, yeah. Cool things, of course, to see are uh, seahorses. The seahorse is actually the slowest moving fish in the sea. They practically rely on their camouflage, their ability to remain hidden in order to survive because they're just so slow. And there are two main species of seahorses you can find in Singapore, but primarily at Pulau Hantu, we see this particular one, which is called the tiger tail seahorse. And it gets its name because if you look at its tail, it's got stripes just like a tiger, so we call it a tiger tail seahorse. A threatened um, animal in Singapore is this icon sea star, rarely seen anywhere else in the world, um, and heavily collected um, for ornamentation. So these are some of the reasons why we need to uh, protect our natural biodiversity. A lot of these animals possess, you know, interesting